if you have that uh, book, it's from pages uh, 9 through 12. I just want to read this short excerpt as a way of introduction. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. <clears throat> it uh, was organized for service, and it, its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church shall be uh, to the world his fullness and his sufficiency. The, the sufficiency. The members of the church, those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ. The church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Amen. I'd just like to have just an added word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we are nothing. I am nothing. I can't prepare uh, to witness to people that you can go before me. And I ask that you would do that with our uh, missionary workers that are here with us too as they knock on doors and as our church grows. Send us uh, and go before us with your Holy Spirit. And Father, <clears throat> we ask that uh, even though uh, uh, we're uh, nothing, our righteousness is, is nothing, yours yes. is and it's fully uh, sufficient. So we ask that you would continue to bless us and make us grow. Help us to be strong in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last Wednesday at sundown, the Jewish festival of Yom Kippur ended. It was a 24-hour day of reflection. Anciently, this time, <coughs> this year was um, a very solemn time, an investigating judgment. The types and symbols, the day of atonement pointed forward <coughs> to an atypical day of an atonement near the end of days at the time of the end. <clears throat> Indeed, the entire sanctuary service day to day pointed forward to heaven, to a redeemer, a savior, a substitute for sin. The people then looked forward to the cross of Christ. We today look back to the cross and what it uh, has accomplished. What, it, what was accomplished there for us? And we're told in the, the book of Hebrews that there is a sanctuary in heaven. The heavenly sanctuary was the great original and God gave exact instructions as to how earth, the earthly sanctuary was to be built. Just to review briefly, God had said <coughs> that it was to be the place for him to dwell as he directed and guided his people. Exodus 28, 8 says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So what did God's people learn from the sanctuary? David the psalmist tells us, Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Psalms 77 verse 13. Where did Moses get the blueprints for the sanctuary? From God. From God. <clears throat> the sanctuary was a building, a copy of what was in heaven. Turn with me to your in your Bible if you have it to Hebrews chapter 8. Let's look at some of these texts. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 and 2 and uh, Four and five. Is everyone there? <laughs> Amen. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. A minister for the sanctuary, of, a minister of the sanctuary, pardon me, and of the true tabernacle, which 
the Lord pitched and not man. Verse 3, I mean verse um, uh, 4, for, the, for it were on earth, or if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto example and shadow of the heaven, of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see said he that thou makest all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount so the blueprint the plans came directly from god and it wasn't just some uh invented way of worship it was directed by god <clears throat> Exodus chapters 26 and 27 gives us the exact dimensions of both the outer courtyard of the building based on the measure of a cubit. Both the outer dimensions and actually the, the building itself. So the cubit, if the cubit was 18 inches, the area around the sanctuary tent was 75 by 150 feet. The sanctuary was measured the night sanctuary itself measured 15 feet by 45 feet. A rectangle, in other words. And you can see how it was divided. Uh, there was two parts. The holy part and the most holy part. And it's fascinating to read about the materials that were used for each part. But I want us to focus on the furniture of the entire structure. The courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. Um... Well, let's just think about, first of all, what was in the uh, outer courtyard. Somehow or another, I'm missing the page, but I could try to do this from memory. Somebody help me if I go off off the off course here. The but the outer courtyard, there was two pieces of furniture. What were they? One was the labor. One was the labor. The first one was the altar. And then the next one was the labor. And what was the function of the um, the altar, what did it point to? <coughs> the Lamb of God. Right. It pointed to the cross. It pointed to Christ's sacrifice. Okay. And the next part was the labor, and the labor was essentially a a giant bowl, a uh, brass bowl that the priests used to wash their hands with before they went into the service. And their feet. And their feet. Thank you for bringing me that. Bring that out too. We see that they were to be cleansed for God's service uh, and, and in advance. <clears throat> and then um, the uh, next part of, of, of the uh, uh, sanctuary was the holy place. And there's three articles of furniture in the holy place. And again, we can read about this in Exodus chapter 25. It tells us all about this. But what were those three articles of furniture? Table of showbread. Table of showbread. Lampstand. The seven branch candle altar, the seven branch candlestick, and incense. the altar of incense. Okay. And they were placed on one side. The showbread was on one one side. Can you help me with the directions? Was that uh, on the on the south side, I believe? And if you look toward the most holy place, and then on the other side was the candelabra. And what did the table of showbread represent? Bread. The bread of life, which is again an imagery of Jesus. They understood what the cross was to be and what the, the sacrifice was to be. Yes, go ahead. The bread was baked on Sabbath by the priest. Right. They put new on the table of shoe bread. So that was showing that God gives us new blessings anew every Sabbath. Every day, yeah. But Jesus is the bread of life. And we're told that as we have our communion from time to time, that the bread of life, um, and Jesus said that of himself, that he is the bread of life. I 
and then uh, the next uh, part of the uh, of the uh, sanctuary was the uh, most holy place. Now, skipping over the the furniture of the of the altar of incense that represented God's prayer, uh, the prayers of God, the people going up ascending to God. But that was right next to the curtain, that, the veil that separated the holy place and the most holy place. Okay. And so the prayers were to wake up and go over into the, the uh, holy place with this, as the incense was burned as a sweet smelling sacrifice to the Lord. Okay, so, and when we move into the most holy place, what do we find? What article of furniture? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. Only one article of furniture, but it was really kind of complex. It was a huge chest, as it were. Not so huge, but you know, a huge. And on top of it, what was what was found on top of this chest? Covering cherubs. Care, covering of the angels, the cherubs. And actually, if you read in, in I think it's uh, Psalms chapter 80, there's some place in the scriptures that show that this, that their angels covers uh, God's throne. So actually, the part between the angels is represented. To us as God's throne, His place, of, His place of dwelling, and uh, so um, the angels overcovered that. And then, um, what was uh, that also considered? The mercy. Seat. The mercy seat. Amen, <coughs> sister. That was also the mercy seat. And inside the lid of the ark, you pull the lid out, and there was the what? The Ten, the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments were always to be kept by God's people everywhere and every place. They always intended to be kept um, in every age. And turn with me to Revelation 14, 12, just for a, a text regarding this. <clears throat> Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints... Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Those go hand in hand. Faith is not uh, against uh, keeping God's commandments. There's no... They are meant to be presented together. That's part of the everlasting gospel. Now, what was... Uh, Above the tables of stone, it was the mercy seat. And this signifies that as long as God's people confessed and forsook their sins, they would have grace extended to them through the blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat by the high priest. Let's look at uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 28, 13. Psalms, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 28. And verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. This is King James. We might say uh, hide his sins. He shall not prosper. But whosoever confesses and forsake them shall have mercy. Why is this so important that we confess? We can't have salvation without true confession of sin and repentance. We're told that in the scriptures. But it's the blood that was sprinkled by the high priest. What they did was um, on the day, of, the ancient day of atonement was they actually cleansed the sanctuary uh, of all the sins that accumulated through the year by the sprinkling of blood. Even it was such a solemn time and event that uh, even the high priest, the priest that was chosen to go in there, had to make sure that there was no sins in his life. They even had little bells on the black trees of their garments to ring. As they went in there, if they if they didn't hear the bells, that meant that it wasn't acceptable. 
and and uh, but uh, God, he, they took the the uh, blood of the lamb. Again, what did the blood symbolize? The blood of Christ that should die in the, in the, in the future to come and die. The Messiah would die. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We're told in Revelation 13:8, but that was sprinkled on the uh, mercy seat, and it was uh, meant to cleanse people of their sins. The whole, the whole um, uh, congregation, and there was uh, the. And I'll encourage you to read more about it. The the two goats that were slain, the two, two animals that were slain. There was a, a lamb, a pure lamb that was slain, and then um, transferring the sins of the congregation, and then, the, then to take the sins away from the congregation, a scapegoat was used, and it was led out into the wilderness. There's imagery after imagery telling us in advance that there was going to be a Messiah, a Redeemer to come to the nation of Israel, to God's people, His church, then. And again, as I said earlier, we look back to what um, Christ did on the cross, His blood, and how that atonement was made for us. And they look forward to that through their types and uh, the rituals that they did then how that was to be for each one. Um, the blood would be shed for us for the forgiveness of sin, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Let's look at um, a couple of texts. Uh, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. My pages are sticking together. Perhaps I should have put some markers in. Okay. Um, verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. For what? Remission. The remission of sins. And... Um, we can go ahead and read verse 29. But I say to you, I will not drink hence of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's a wonderful promise, something that we can look forward to. Amen. Now turn with me over to the book of Hebrews. This time we're going to look at chapter 9. Um, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by law pure, purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Okay, in verse 23 It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Without the Savior, no one has any hope of salvation. I really enjoyed our Sabbath school lesson, Will, and Will brought that out so clearly and good in that lesson. Without, without a Messiah, a Savior to come to crush and bruise the head of the serpent, we would all be still in our sins, and we would all... Uh, face not only damnation, but we would be doomed as a people. And I want us to turn in this regard to those texts we looked at this morning in, in Exodus chapter 315, and that, as Will Genesis. pointed out, is the gospel in a nutshell. Genesis. I'm, saying, I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And uh, as we studied this morning, it is the gospel in a Nutshell, but I don't think that some of us were here for that. So um, I ask that your indulgence as well. We repeat it here. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, 
So it was brought out that that enmity was hatred, hatred of wrong and sin. But actually, Satan is the embodiment of that. He was a murderer from the beginning. He was the first one that told lies. And he is our continued enemy today. But I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, a lot of times we think, most often I think we think, Will, that we're talking about that, that time on the cross when Christ died and his blood was shed. In that way, his, um, uh, he bruised the head of the serpent. And this is true. But I'd like with you, want you to turn with me to Romans chapter uh, 16 as well. You know, this text has, is so full. It's more than just the gospel in a nutshell. It goes beyond that. It talks about the destruction, destruction of all sin. Look at Romans chapter 16, and let's look at verse, uh, I think it's verse 20, might be verse 19. I'm slowly getting there. Uh, okay. Um, chapter 16, verse 19. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto which is good and simple concerning evil. Simple could be also um, not uh, over-concerned with, uh, with evil. And then verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Okay? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So at this point, he's looking forward to uh, Christ bruising the head of the serpent, Satan shortly, completely, forever. That's going to happen. He did it on the cross as far as being a ransom, a sacrifice for us. Since he was not only the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he is our Lord, but he also wants to be our substitute. He wants us to allow him into our lives to take the place of our life of sin and also give us power to become the sons and daughters of God, as John chapter 1, verse 12 says. Um, he gives us that power if we allow him to do that. <clears throat> what did John the Baptist say when he saw Jesus approaching him? What did he cry out when he saw Jesus? Was he was baptizing in the river Jordan and Jesus walked before him? Toward him. What were the words of John the Baptist? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. In the book of Acts, we are told that there is no other way to salvation except through the man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And let's look at that again in, in Acts chapter um, 4. Chapter 4 and verse 12 particularly, but it's interesting to look at some of the other verses as well. Verse 12, neither there is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given among men for my must be saved. So in verse 10 it says, it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he have crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Even by him does this man stand here before you hold. They were trying to, uh, uh, you remember, attack Peter and John and say, listen, why, you know, what are you doing here? And uh, But they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And... Uh, this power that raised this man was the same power that raised Jesus Christ. The resurrection. It was the power of God and not of Peter and John. And so they were, they were studying the book of Acts on Wednesday night uh, meeting time, 6.30. I encourage all of you to come here. We're going through these deep things of the Holy Spirit and, and as recorded in the book of Acts. There's two things that this provided for us. It's Jesus' uh, life and death. Um, let's look at uh, John 
turn back just a few pages to John chapter 3, John's Gospel. Praise the Lord for these texts. I remember as a child, my mother would tell us, you must be born again. <laughs> I don't know if she fully understood what it meant, but she knew that we had to be changed, that we couldn't of ourselves ever hope to have salvation. So I praise God for that upbringing. Um, verses chapter 3, uh, verses, we're going to read 3 through 6 on chapter 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. There's a transaction that takes place when we come to Christ. It may be slow, it may be gradual. We may not be able to say, this was the day that I accepted Christ. Um, there's people, I've heard people say, well, if you can't say the day or the time, then you're not really saved. That's not what the Bible teaches, friends. And it may be imperceptible, the steps that are leading us to Christ in our lives, in our journey. But it's nevertheless true. Uh, it's like the, he illustrated the wind. We don't see the wind, but we feel uh, its power and uh, see it rustling in the, in the leaves. We see the tremendous power of the storms. God's Holy Spirit is like that, and He comes to each and every man in different ways at different times, maybe dramatically and maybe subtly and quiet. But we must accept Jesus if we're going to have hope of salvation for the cleansing of, us, of our sins and also, also for um, the power to walk and live with Him. Well, I have a whole host of texts that I've got, I could read here, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just encourage you to do it, uh, to read it. Um, Jesus keeps us and keeps us strong uh, and saves us and... and uh, has the power to redeem us. Philippians um, 1 6. What does Jude tell us? He is able to keep us from falling. Jude chapter 1, verse 24. There's only one chapter, but verse 24. And Jesus alone must be our example. Let's turn to this one. 1 Peter 2 21. God wants to. Um, Build us up, folks. He wants us to have the kind of life He intended for each one of us to have. A life complete in Him. Verse uh, 21 of uh, 1 Peter, and I'm going to look, read verse 2, verse 23. For even thereunto ye were called, because Christ also suffered for us, having us and leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. And when he suffered, <clears throat> he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges rightly. And what does the Lord want us to be? What does he want us to become? Um, I refer to you to Ephesians chapter 3. First few verses and then down to verse 14 and through. He wants us to have this power in our lives to become overcomers. And 1 Peter chapter 2 says that we are a lively church, a spiritual church. Reading from chapter 2 verse 3, if you... Be, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of God and precious ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ wherefore also it 
contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Whereunto they also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous life, which in times past were not a people, but now the people of God, <clears throat> which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen.